The Ark of the Covenant You may order a copy of this program through arcdiscovery.com. See arcdiscovery.com to become a direct seller of this DVD. Join us now as we begin Revealing God's Treasure. You may order a copy of this program through arcdiscovery.com. See arcdiscovery.com to become a direct seller of this DVD. The Ark of the Covenant. As we look at an old map of Jerusalem, we can see the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, situated well inside the city walls. This is the traditional Catholic and Greek Orthodox site of Jesus' crucifixion and burial. The site for the church was chosen in the 4th century by the Roman Emperor Constantine's self-proclaimed psychic mother, Helena, who was attracted to the site because the Temple of Venus was at this location.
As we enter the building, we can see a mural of the crucifixion and burial of Christ. Upon entering the rotunda, we can look up to see the dome with the rays of the sun on the ceiling. Then we pan down to see the tomb. We ponder the question, is this the correct location for Jesus' crucifixion and burial? Does this site match the biblical account? As we make our way to the exit, we see the adoration of the stone of anointing, where some think Jesus' body was prepared for burial. From the church, we will be heading north towards the Damascus Gate. We're traveling through a Muslim bazaar, and it's Friday, so the Muslims are streaming into the city for worship. Our destination is an alternative location for Jesus' crucifixion site one that is outside the city. John chapter 19 states, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, this tells us he was executed outside the city walls. Approaching the Damascus Gate on the north side of the city, it is the most beautiful of Jerusalem's 11 gates. These walls were constructed in the 16th century by the Ottoman Turk Suleiman I. This map indicates the current walls follow the line of the old walls from Jesus' day. Making our way through the large gate, we continue to meet worshipers entering the city. We can see the ornate structure of the walls, and as we glance down, the base of the walls from 31 AD can still be seen today. From here, we will head northeast a short distance to the area identified as Jeremiah's Grotto. It is there that we can see the place of the skull, which was discovered in the late 19th century. We are walking just a short distance north along Nablus Road. Next, we turn east onto Conrad Schick and make our way to the Garden Tomb Grounds. And he, bearing his cross, went out to a place called the Place of a Skull, which is called in Hebrew Golgotha, where they crucified him. Making our way through the garden, we come to an observation deck overlooking the place of the skull. We can see the two eye sockets and the nose.
A side profile of the skull clearly shows us a definite nose bridge. We make our way back to the garden area. Now, in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb in which no one had yet been laid. There is evidence of this area having been a garden in Jesus' day. Here we see this ancient wine press, which is the third largest in the Jerusalem area. Undoubtedly, a vineyard must have been in this area. Another element, which indicates this area was a garden in biblical times, is this ancient water cistern from the pre-Christian era, capable of holding 250,000 gallons of water. The depth of the cistern is 31 feet, its width 29 feet, and its length 65 feet. We can get a size perspective from this photo taken inside the cistern. Now, we finally make our way to the garden tomb, where many guests have come to this special place. The tomb was discovered in 1867, then researched extensively in 1883 by General Charles Gordon, who associated it with the place of the skull and the area of Jesus' crucifixion. We are told in the Bible that Joseph of Arimathea was a rich man, and thus we can expect the tomb he had constructed would be quite extravagant and large. There are several ancient crosses associated with the tomb. The largest cross is to the right of the tomb and was cut out of the escarpment. To the left of the entrance to the tomb is a simple anchor cross. Another interesting feature is this depression, which has been cut out of the bedrock for early Christians to sit on the stone ledge and practice the service of humility, or foot washing. A large stone would have been rolled in this track and would have covered the entrance to the tomb. And he laid him in a tomb, which had been hewn out of the rock, and rolled a stone against the door of the tomb. So they went and made the tomb secure, sealing the stone. To the left of the tomb entrance is the end of a broken iron shaft that was driven into the escarpment by Roman guards to prevent the stone from being rolled backwards and opening the tomb. On resurrection morning, a powerful heavenly angel easily broke off this iron rod and rolled the stone back, opening the tomb. But when they looked up, they saw that the stone had been rolled away, for it was very large. Measuring the distance between the iron rod and the stone ledge to the right, the distance is 13 feet. This would be the size of the extremely large rolling stone. As we enter the tomb, the first chamber to our left is the weeping chamber. As we look to the right, we can see one crypt that has been used. The area for the feet was cut out, lengthening the space for burial. This is where the Son of God rested after having lived a selfless and sinless life for us. To the right is an unused crypt. Then we pan back over to the used crypt where angels sat at either end after Christ had risen. Jesus is risen. He is our substitute and redeemer. Praise the Lord. Now, in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb, in which no one yet been laid. From this we know the crucifixion site was near a garden and a tomb, the areas we've been inspecting thus far. So this is what we have. Golgotha, the place of the skull to our right, and the garden tomb to our left, and in between we have the crucifixion site of Christ. Jerusalem was built on Mount Moriah, outlined here in blue.
This is where God asked Abraham to sacrifice Isaac 2,000 years before Christ. God instead offered his own son to be sacrificed on this same mountain. The area outlined in green is the northern portion of the mountain and the highest area of Moriah, where Golgotha is located. This area is of special interest. The limestone escarpment shown here has Roman cutouts in the stone that were used during crucifixions. To the left is a horizontal slot where the Roman army standard would have been displayed. The large cutout is where a sign would have been placed, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. It has an arched top and a flat shelf. Our Ark Discovery International team found similar cutouts in Israel at Caesarea Philippi. They had a curved top and a flat shelf where signs or objects were placed. The earth quaked and the rocks were split. A large fissure or crack in the escarpment starts at the top of the escarpment and then extends down the face of the rock. Today, part of the fissure has been filled in. It connects with the cutouts where the signs were placed. We now present the most important material on earth, the discovery of the Ark of the Covenant and the evidence it holds. Although photographs of this find will not be shown today, we do have the faithful witness of Ron Wyatt, whose credibility was established through the other discoveries we have already seen thus far. The Lord used Mr. Wyatt to find other discoveries so we can trust his testimony regarding this most important find. In God's appointed time, we will all see this incredible discovery. Here now is Ron Wyatt and the Ark of the Covenant. I had had an unusual experience. The Lord had helped me find the remains of Noah's Ark. He had helped me find the remains of the Egyptian chariot hearts and horse parts and people parts in the Red Sea in the Gulf of Aqaba. And I had gone to the Middle East with my sons. We had trained as divers, scuba divers, and we were going to get some of those chariot parts out. Well, <clears throat> due to my carelessness, I got sunburned to the point that my legs swelled up, my feet, and all of this, and I couldn't get my diving equipment on. So I was up in Jerusalem hobbling around, feeling very, very rained on, <clears throat> waiting for my cheap airline ticket, the date that was on it to arrive so we could fly home. We didn't have the money to change the ticket. And uh, during this time, I was hobbling around the city a little bit, and one day I met this archaeologist who was in charge of the Jerusalem area there. And uh, why he should be talking to me, I don't have a clue. Uh, I didn't look very presentable. We uh, were staying in a youth hostel, sleeping in our clothes. I'm sure I didn't smell very good. Maybe I was fortunate enough that he was upwind from me or something. But anyway, we got into a conversation and I told him about Noah's Ark and then I explained to him how the pyramids were built and that seemed to uh, get his attention. So he says, I've been doing some digging along this cliff face here. He says, how about coming along with me and, and have a look at it and see what you think. So I was walking along looking, these were Roman ruins and remains and my left hand suddenly pointed out at a grubby looking hole in the rock where there was garbage, two dead cats, uh, just, uh, shall we say, nasty stuff. And my mouth said, that's Jeremiah's grotto and the Ark of the Covenant is in there. This guy said, that's wonderful. He said, we will let you excavate there and we'll provide you a place to stay, your food, your laundry. I can 
you know, understand why he mentioned laundry. <laughs> but I couldn't understand a Jewish person being that generous. That's not their nature. And I was stunned because I had not been thinking about the Ark of the Covenant at all. You know, wondering why on earth we hadn't been able to get some chariot wheels out. You see, I pray about everything, folks. I did back then, too. I knew I was supposed to be there. But what I thought I was supposed to be there for was not what I was supposed to be there for. So anyway, our ticket was due to the date that uh, finally arrived, and that was the next morning after we had this conversation, or after I had the conversation with this man. So I said, well, that's great. I'll come back and do that. Now I've got to go home, you know, and make some preparations. So anyway, I went home wondering why on earth the Ark of the Covenant could possibly be in that place. So I read in chapter, uh, rather in 2 Kings chapter 25 where it says that the whole city was surrounded by a siege wall. So anyway, I became persuaded that the Ark of the Covenant was indeed in that place because I knew some supernatural force had used my arm and my voice. When it first happened, I didn't know which one. And we're instructed to try the spirits to see whether they be of God. We can't flatter ourselves and say anything that comes out of my mouth because I pray and all of this. That anything I say must be from God. We have to check it against the law and the testimony regardless of where it comes from. Even ourselves. But what I discovered when I started excavating down that cliff wall, first of all, I discovered the cutouts in the wall of the cliff where they had posted the signs, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. I found the cross holes in a place that I had no idea they would be, and that was at the base of that cliff. Of course, now that we found them, we realized that that's where the public road went back and forth through there. It was, you know, the ideal place for a crucifixion. Had to be, otherwise the Romans probably wouldn't have chosen it. Ron Wyatt worked for many years on the Ark of the Covenant excavation. He conducted his work under a permit issued by the Israel Antiquities Authority, but the permit was not made public due to the nature and sensitivity of the work. Some critics have said he never even worked in the grounds of the Garden Tomb area, but as you can see here, his presence was well established. At times, he would have many people helping with the excavation above ground and below. We acknowledge that the Book of Maccabees in the Apocrypha is not an inspired book, but it may have some historical information which we can glean. Here it states, Jeremiah found a cave dwelling. He carried the tent, the ark, and the incense altar into it. Then he blocked up the entrance. The place shall remain unknown, he said, until God finally gathers his people together and shows mercy to them. Then the Lord will bring these things to light again. When Christ died and the earth shook and the rocks were rent, a crack came right down the entire face of the escarpment, right past the left side of the cross hole, and the stone opened up. Down below, 20 feet below, God had arranged for the Ark of the Covenant with its mercy seat, if you please, his earthly throne to be positioned right down there 600 years before in 586 B.C. <coughs> when the Babylonian army destroyed the city. 
when the centurion stuck his spear in Christ's spleen and probably left ventricle to make sure he was dead before he gave the body to Joseph of Arimathea when he pulled that spear out, the separated platelets and serum of the blood of the Son of God gushed out, went down through that crack onto the mercy seat. And that ratified the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. The fourth trip I made into this chamber, it was spotless. The furnishings were set in perfect order. The Ark of the Covenant, however, had been placed against the wall, the end of the cave. The end of the cave was a beautiful crystal radiating the colors of the rainbow. Now I know New Age and all that goes in for rainbows, so do homosexuals and all of that. But God used it first, all right? It's around his throne and it's around his earthly throne. Now, there's no veil in this setup. So it is the earthly, it's God's temple on earth, or his residence where he once dwelt. And uh, anyway, when I found it like this, there were four young men standing in there. And I started to say, you know, what are you doing here? And I froze. I couldn't move, couldn't breathe, couldn't do anything. One of the people said, we are the four angels that have been taking care of the ark since Moses put the tables of stone in it, right? And they instructed me to set up my video camera with the tripod, aim it at the ark of the covenant. And they went over lifted the mercy seat up. I don't know how heavy it is. I've never tried to lift it, but it's solid gold. And the angel said, take the tables of stone out of there. God wants everyone to see those. I took them out. All right. They put the mercy seat back down over the Ark of the Covenant. I backed away a little bit. The angel came, got the tables of stone, put them on a rock ledge inside the chamber, and I was then instructed to take a sample of the blood from the mercy seat, have that analyzed, and I did everything the angel told me to do. Real quickly, okay, uh, dried blood is dead blood. Everybody knows that, all right? They can test the blood of the pharaohs, the mummies of the pharaohs, all right? There's certain things they can do. They cannot get a chromosome count by any method I'm familiar with, all right? Things keep changing. I don't profess to know everything. However, there's no way I know that you can get a chromosome count out of dead blood. You can get a DNA and some other things, but not a chromosome count, all right? That's done by living white blood cells. Now then, first of all, in this analysis, I took the blood into a laboratory in Israel. I asked one of the people I work with in, in antiquities, where is a good laboratory that does reliable work? And they said, such and such, such and such. I took it. I just said, please examine this blood and tell me what you can tell me about it. All right? They said, well, look, we're going to reconstitute it. We're going to put it in normal saline and keep it at body temperature for 72 hours with uh, gentle swirling. All right, that's their business, that's great. I said, now I want to be there when you check it out. They said, fine. So I was back, they checked it out. I said, now, uh, they said it's human blood, we can tell that. They did whatever tests they need to do. And then I said, take some of the white blood cells and put them in a growth medium and keep them at body temperature for 48 hours. And they said, well, that'll do no good because it's dead blood. I said, would you please do that for me? And they said, okay, we'll do it. So anyway, I said, I want to be there when you take it out and examine it. So I was back there. They took it out, examined it under a microscope. And the one technician called the other one over there. And then they called the boss over there. And they were talking Hebrew a mile a minute there for a little bit. And they looked at me and they said, Mr. Wyatt, this human blood only has 24 chromosomes in it. 
everybody else has 46. You see 23 from your mother, 23 from your father, 22 autosomes from your mother, 22 autosomes from your father. You get an X from your mother, you may get an X or a Y from your father, all right? This blood had 23 chromosomes from the mother's side, one Y chromosome only. You see, the ch a child could not have developed if they hadn't had the autosomes from the mother. So all of his physical characteristics were determined by his mother's side of the family, her autosomes. His maleness was determined by this one Y that came from a source, not a human male. Then they said, this blood is alive. And then they said, whose blood is this? I said, it's the blood of your Messiah. And I assure you, those men's lives have changed. Jesus' blood flowed out of his side, a crimson current onto the rocks below, and onto the mercy seat of the Ark of the Covenant, ratifying the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. In the New Testament, it mentions the blood hidden in the earth. This is he who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ, not only by water, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit that bears witness, because the Spirit is truth. For there are three that bear witness in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit, and these three are one. And there are three that bear witness on earth, the Spirit, the water, and the blood, and these three agree as one. If we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. For this is the witness of God, which he has testified of his Son. In these free handouts, it gives these verses. Now I'll share a couple of them with you. 1 John chapter 5, verses 8 and 9. It says, there are three that bear witness in earth, not in the earth, but in earth, meaning under the ground, the spirit, the water, and the blood. And these three agree in one. Then verse nine, it says, if we receive the witness of man, the witness of God is greater. And this, speaking of the blood and the water presented to our hearts and minds through the power of the Holy Spirit. This is the Father's witness and testimony of his Son. Now in a court trial, a witness gives a testimony. That testimony becomes evidence or proof, all right? So what this is saying in our language of today is that the blood and water on the mercy seat of the Ark of the Covenant, the earthly throne of the living God, is the Father's proof to the inhabitants of this world that his Son has indeed died for us, that we have been redeemed and that we can come to him in the name and blood of his son, receive forgiveness and restoration so that one day, as recorded in the 22nd chapter, 14th verse of the book of Revelation, it says, blessed are they that do his commandments, that they might have a right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. The, pavement, uh, the payment, dear friends, has been made. And in God's appointed time, you will be able to see the proof for yourself. I believe the Ark of the Covenant will stay right where it is throughout eternity. It is God the Father's proof to the inhabitants of this earth that his son died for us. Now, there are some things that are going to happen in the future that will involve 144,000 getting to see that. All right? And it's not according to a lot of people's stories about the millennium and all. 
Folks, I'll have to tell you this, nothing is going to happen like the majority of people believe it's going to. The Bible says, run not after a multitude to do evil. It says, wide, broad is the gate, or wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction. Many go in there, straight is the gate, narrow the way that leads to life everlasting. So all of these doctrines that about the millennium and all these other things are cunningly devised fables. It's not going to happen that way. We need to go to the Father in the name and blood of his Son, ask for forgiveness, restoration to his likeness, read the King James Version of the Bible enthusiastically, often, and with prayer. And God will reveal to you what we need to know to be ready. But I don't think it'll be brought out. Tables of stone and video. Okay. In the Old Testament, it mentions a special anointing on the Ark of the Covenant. Seventy weeks are determined for your people and your holy city to finish the transgression to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the Most Holy. Anoint the Most Holy is key here. The ultimate anointing substance is the blood of Jesus. The Most Holy is the mercy seat or top of the Ark of the Covenant. The Most Holy place of the tabernacle was called such because the Most Holy resided in that apartment. Jesus' blood anointed the Most Holy, just as predicted in this prophecy. He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. The Old English word propitiation means mercy seat. Jesus is the mercy seat. By His blood on the mercy seat, we have mercy today and forgiveness of sins. His sinless life is represented by that sinless blood. We have mercy and forgiveness if we break the law and are then repentant. He shall take some of the blood of the bull and sprinkle it with his finger on the mercy seat on the east side. For hundreds of years, the blood of bulls and goats was cast toward the east, creating a vacant western side on the mercy seat. God was planning for the blood of his son to be applied on the vacant western side of the mercy seat. Your way, O God, is in the sanctuary. Our salvation was to come through Jesus' blood being applied on the mercy seat of the ark. This was God's plan from the beginning, that Christ's blood would anoint the mercy seat of the ark with the Ten Commandments below, thus fulfilling the new covenant and granting mercy to mankind. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all, to be testified in due time. This is a future event where all mankind will see the irrefutable evidence that Jesus is the Messiah. For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make atonement for your souls, for it is the blood that makes atonement for the soul. Jesus' blood had to be applied to the ark to atone for our sins. His sinless life was in that blood, and it atoned for our sins when applied upon the mercy seat. The mercy seat has a crown molding with a bell, meaning life, and a pomegranate, meaning resurrection. This represented Jesus, our resurrection and life. One of the objects Mr. Wyatt turned over to the Israel Antiquities Authority is this small ivory pomegranate. It has an inscription around its shoulder stating, holy to the priests, belonging to the temple of Yahweh. This is the only publicly known object from the first temple, Solomon's temple. It is featured on an Israeli stamp next to an image of Solomon's temple. The ivory pomegranate is on display today in the Israel Museum under secure guard.
Yes, the tables of stone are out of the Ark of the Covenant. They're in the chamber on this ledge as far as I know. But when God is ready for this to be shown to the world, and the angel told me it will be after the Mark of the Beast law is enforced. You understand that? You keep God's law, you have the seal of God. If you keep man's law, which soon will be passed, and if you refuse to keep their law, you can't buy or sell. If you keep their law, it requires that you break God's, and you have the mark of the beast, okay? You may know better and just go along with it, then you have it in your hand. Great disasters will cover the earth, which will bring on the time of trouble and the mark of the beast. There is a great controversy taking place today. The forces of darkness are warring against the forces of light in a great battle over our souls. In the near future, this will culminate during the Mark of the Beast showdown. Here we have two groups identified in two texts during this Mark of the Beast law. Here is the first group, the lost. They have no rest, day or night, who worship the beast and his image, and whoever receives the mark of his name. These people have received the mark of the beast. The next group are the saved. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. The saved are obeying the Ten Commandments during the mark of the beast law through the faith of Jesus. They have refused to follow a law of the beast and of the government, which goes contrary to the Ten Commandments. They have allowed the Holy Spirit to take over their lives to enable them to become overcomers and obedient to God's law. Come out of her, my people, lest you share in her sins, and lest you receive of her plagues. But folks, the Ark of the Covenant has been found. The tables of stone are available. When God is ready, they will be shown to the inhabitants of this earth. And everyone will be made aware of what God requires of them. So, in the near future, when the mark of the beast law is enforced, forcing men to violate one of the Ten Commandments or else lose their right to buy and sell, those test results showing the unique number of chromosomes will be shown to the world along with video of the Ark and the Ten Commandments. This will conclude the spreading of the gospel to the world. All mankind will have to confess their sins in Jesus' name and obey the Ten Commandments through the Holy Spirit or they will receive the mark of the beast and be lost. Everyone on earth will be in trouble, in trouble with the government, or in trouble with God. Christ will then return to take his people home.
The Ark of the Covenant You may order a copy of this program through arcdiscovery.com. See arcdiscovery.com to become a direct seller of this DVD.